More recently, his research focuses on high dimensional statistics and learning from bias dependent and strategic data. Uh, he has been honored many prestigious awards. Uh, I'll only mention a few recent ones. He won the Neville Linner Prize by the International Mathematical Union. He also won the Simons Investigator Award and more recently the ACN Grace Murray Hopper Award. Today, he will tell us about his new work uh, on equilibrium computation and the foundations of deep learning. Without further ado, let's welcome Costas. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, it is a great pleasure to present uh, in this interdisciplinary seminar. Uh, and uh, um, I, you know, I'm also pleased to present work that uh, um, uh, intersects uh, game theory and machine uh, learning. So this work is a uh, joint work with uh, uh, Stratis Koulakis, who, was, who is a currently a postdoc at SUPD and who was visiting me when this work took place. Um, uh, as well as Manoli Zabetakis, who is my PhD, who was my PhD student and is currently a postdoc at Berkeley, at UC Berkeley. Um, so, the motivation, uh, uh, a motivation for this talk is uh, to understand the following uh, interesting uh, phenomenon, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, we, um, I'm sorry, I have some issues again. <laughs> I cannot, okay. So, uh, on, you know, on the, on the left hand side, we see, uh, you know, one of the greatest achievements of uh, deep learning in recent years, which is to beat human players in very complex games such as Go. On the right hand side, we see a Waymo car that is trying to enter a highway, but is not being led by human players, so much so that it abandons the attempt and uh, exits the highway and re-enters it and tries to re-enter it uh, uh, again. So my question is, how is it that machine learning models beat humans uh, in Go but cannot enter highways. So in particular, how is it that uh, machine learning models uh, uh, beat humans in very complex games, but uh, uh, in other simpler strategic uh, scenarios that many of us can solve to some extent, uh, uh, machine learning models cannot uh, compete well. And, um, uh, sort of like a, a, an oversimplified view of uh, the remarkable progress that has been happening in uh, deep learning says that a lot of that uh, progress has been enabled by the ability of uh, hardware and software systems to uh, optimize, to do gradient descent on very complex learning models. Of course, this is only part of the picture. It's not just that we can optimize very complex models, but also we have, um, we have figured out uh, um, useful learning objectives. Uh, we have collected a lot of data for various applications of interest. We have developed nice models uh, and we have uh, hardware where we can train our models. But on the optimization uh, side, uh, a, a lot of the progress is enabled by the fact that we can train these models. Um, now, uh, the empirical finding is that uh, in several uh, complex uh, learning uh, settings, even though the optimization landscape that arises uh, through our learning uh, uh, formulations is a non-convex uh, uh, problem, uh, nevertheless, gradient descent or its variants uh, discover uh, local minima which uh, generalize well uh, outside of the uh, training data. Now, the motivation for this talk is that uh, either already now and certainly down the road, we won't be thinking about a single learning system that is uh, collecting data from its environment and optimizing its behavior on the data that it collected, but various learning systems that are present in the environment at the same time. 
uh, collecting data and optimizing their behavior in the same environment, as well as interacting with each other. And uh, uh, the issue from an optimization standpoint in this type of scenario is that uh, uh, what practical experience tells us is that gradient descent uh, versus gradient descent versus gradient descent uh, has a hard time converging, let alone to a meaningful solution. So, you know, one of the motivating questions of this talk is, you know, what optimization procedure should we endow our learning agents if those learning agents are going to find themselves in environments that contain other learning agents and interacting and making decisions in the same environment. So this practical experience that, you know, so gradient descent uh, is not, uh, does not seem to be the right algorithm. And what I would like to investigate through this talk is how deep uh, that issue is. Um, and um, the um, gradient descent, as it turns out, faces uh, issues with convergence, not uh, necessarily when you have a multitude of learning agents that are learning together, but even when you have two learning agents, and even when their objective uh, functions are uh, directly uh, opposed to one another. In particular, uh, gradient descent has issues uh, converging even, uh, even when uh, you have uh, two learning agents that are controlling uh, variables X and Y, and one is looking to minimize an objective function of the two variables, and the other agent is looking to maximize the uh, function. So in that type of scenario, uh, the naive approach is to have the minimizing player run gradient descent on the variables that it controls, and the maximizing player run gradient ascent on the variables that uh, it controls, uh, in the hopes that uh, running these two gradient descent procedures in parallel will identify a good solution of the min-max uh, problem. Of course, you don't need to run gradient descent. Uh, you can run any variant of gradient descent, but this is, you know, the, 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 you know, the naive thing to do is to run some variant of gradient descent against some variant of gradient ascent. Now, as it turns out, this has a hard time uh, converging to a, meaning, to a meaningful solution. And, um, a prominent uh, case where it fails to converge is in training generative adversarial networks. Uh, I'm not going to dive into the details of what these are, but uh, I'm only going to say that uh, these are min-max formulations whose ultimate goal is to uh, learn how to generate from an interesting high-dimensional distribution. Now, uh, in the following uh, two uh, pictures, what I'm going to show you is what happens to uh, a GAN uh, when you are naive about, you know, just running gradient descent against gradient ascent in the underlying min-max formulation. So in the first uh, picture, uh, I'm showing you what happens to gradient descent ascent when you try to train a generator on the data set that you see uh, on the left, which contains handwritten digits. Uh, on the right, I'm showing you what type of distribution uh, the uh, generator uh, is generating if you stop the training at different, at different steps of training. Uh, as you can see, the generator, uh, um, you know, at different steps of training generates garbage things until it settles to a distribution over uh, garbage symbols. In the bottom example, I'm showing you what happens to a GAN when you train it on a mixture of Gaussians. Uh, so it's a, it's a mixture of Gaussians whose means are arranged on a cycle. Uh, on the right, I'm showing you what happens to the generator if you stop the training at different steps. And again, what you see is a cycling behavior wherein 
the generator is choosing different modes of the mixture of Gaussian, uh, Gaussians and generate only uh, data from that uh, mode. So these are two examples where you are writing a, a minimax formulation and you try to train it in a naive way using gradient descent ascent and you fail to, uh, either you fail to converge or you converge to a garbage uh, solution. But um, you don't have to go so complex to see that gradient descent ascent fails. Maybe the simplest example that you can uh, construct where gradient descent versus gradient ascent fails is this very simple function that you see here, which is to multiply a scalar X with a scalar Y. If you're trying to min max X times Y, where both X and Y are scalars, then uh, using gradient descent, uh, then you get a very simple iterative procedure that you see on the, uh, the bottom, um, uh, and um, and uh, the dynamics of running it are shown on the bottom left, where in uh, the equilibrium, of course, in this scenario, uh, is very simple to to identify. It, it is the zero comma zero point, because unless both x and y play zero, the other player can uh, infinitely punish them, right? Because for example, if Y plays plus five, then X can set themselves to minus infinity and, and, and get the min max objective to minus infinity, right? If Y sets itself to minus five, X can set itself to, I'm sorry, what did I say? To minus five, then X can set itself to plus infinity to also make the min max objective uh, infinitely negative. And in any event, the, it's easy to see that uh, if you minimax x times y, the only equilibrium is the 0, 0, 0,0 points shown with orange in the picture. Nevertheless, if you run gradient descent against gradient ascent to optimize this uh, objective, you get a spiraling behavior that uh, uh, you know starts at the purple, for example, point and spirals, uh, goes around the equilibrium and spirals away from the equilibrium. So this example, this simple example is to say that um, uh, gradient descent against gradient ascent uh, fails in very, very simple settings. Um, uh, in particular, you get training oscillations or garbage solutions, even uh, if you have two agents and zero sum settings, even when the function is convex concave, because x times y is a con convex concave function, even when the objective function, the variables are low dimensional, and even when the function is perfectly known. So this is very alarming because really the settings that we're interested in are those where uh, the objective, uh, so may maybe you have more than two players, not just two players, your objective function is not going to be convex concave, it's going to be non-convex. The variables are going to be high dimensional, and also the function is not known in advance, like x times y, but has also, it also needs to be learned from data. So this is the sort of like a, a little illustration of the types of challenges that uh, arise already in very simple settings, let alone in very complex settings. Uh, maybe I should stop here to uh, uh, take any questions if there are uh, so far. Or otherwise, I'm going to jump to the main uh, uh, question that we will be studying today. I don't think there is any questions in the chat at this moment. Okay, sounds good. So just to cut the long story short, uh, what I'm going to focus on uh, in this talk is a comparison between one setting that wherein we have been very successful, which is minimizing a complex function over some domain versus a setting where we seem to have trouble, which is that of minmaxing a complex function over some domain. So as I said, the left-hand side, like formulating a, a problem as a minimization of a complex objective is what has been driving uh, 
uh, a lot of progress in machine learning uh, in the past uh, decades. Um, where, you know, we cannot hope to find globally optimal solutions, but we can find locally optimal solutions, and these appear to work well for our uh, for practical purposes. On the right hand side, we, we're looking at the min max problem, uh, which is well motivated uh, by practical applications. Nevertheless, we're great in descent, like the, the main method that we have to optimize in high dimensional non convex. Uh, uh, settings seem to uh, uh, have trouble. So I want to compare then what is the difference between these two problems from a mathematical and a uh, computational standpoint. I will be focusing on functions f that are ellipsids and smooth. So in particular, their gradients are also going to be ellipsids. And I'm going to be focusing on scenarios where the set S is convex and compact. And uh, so what do we know about these problems? Well, uh, there are two well-established and well-studied settings for both of these problems. And these well-behaved and well-studied and established settings are when on the left-hand side, the function you're minimizing is convex, and when on the right-hand side, the function that you are min maxing is convex in the minimizing variable and concave in the maximizing variable. In these well behaved settings, the problems are not very different in terms of computational complexity. In both cases, it follows from folklore results that first order methods that is methods which use uh, function values and, and, and a gradient function values, first order methods are able to find approximate minima on the left hand side and approximate min max equilibria on the right hand side in a number of steps and queries to the function and its gradient that are polynomial in the relevant parameters of the problem, namely one over the approximation, the smoothness, and the diameter of the set we're optimizing over. And, and just to be concrete about what I mean about pro approximate minimum uh, and approximate min max equilibria, an approximate minimum is a point x star that you cannot change to any other point x and uh, decrease the function by more than epsilon. A point x star y star is a approximate min max if uh, x star cannot be changed unilaterally to decrease the function by more than epsilon, and y star cannot be uh, changed unilaterally to increase the function by more than epsilon. So for the case where f is convex on the left hand side and when f is convex concave for the right hand side, uh, we, we have several first order methods that can identify approximate globally optimal solutions in a number of steps and queries to the function and its gradient that are polynomial in the relevant parameters. So, all right, so that's great news for min max. And then how does that explain this weird behavior of gradient descent ascent for the function x times y then, right? X times y is a function that is convex and concave given this folklore theorem that I have on the right hand side, how come gradient descent fails in that situation? Well, the answer is that here training oscillations are not due to some, you know, intrinsic inherent computational barrier, but they are features of the optimization procedure. And, you know, one hope is that if you change that procedure modified somehow, then maybe you can avoid the training oscillations. But at the very least, the oscillations are not a byproduct of some underlying computational intractability that uh, underlies the setting. So that is what happens in the well-behaved settings of these problems. Okay, And we're going to dive in a little bit 
into how to remove oscillations in this setting. But the main topic of this uh, talk is what happens uh, in the settings that are important for the modern era of machine learning, which is when F is not convex on the left and F is not convex on K on the right. In this harder, I mean, much harder settings, uh, uh, theoretical computer science response is that, well, what are you hoping to do? Finding globally optimal solutions is an empty hard problem uh, already on the left and a fortiori on the right. But the deep learning reaction, and indeed what has been driving the, so much progress recently is that, yeah, well, globally optimal solutions might be hard, but you know, locally optimal solutions are still fine for many applications, which you know, raises the question, okay, uh, can at least for the left or the hand side or the right hand side, can we at least compute locally optimal solutions? And to be precise, let's, let's, let's you know, pin down some notions of locally optimal solutions. A natural notion for the left is that a point is local epsilon delta locally minimum if um, uh, you know, this point X star cannot be changed locally to some other X to decrease the function by more than epsilon. Delta controls the ball around which I'm looking for deviations and epsilon is the size, the, the amount of improvement that I'm, that, that, you know, that, you know, I don't want to give up. Uh, 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 you know, extending that to uh, the min-max problem on the right, a natural uh, a notion is um, that, uh, um, I'm sorry for, by the way, I'm really sorry for all these notifications that pop up on the right. Uh, my computer is in a very unstable configuration right now, so I don't want to risk stopping the talks. I'm just going to let them flowing, okay? So I'm really sorry about that. And I'm really sorry that you cannot see my face uh, for similar reasons. Okay, uh, so, so extending uh, the notion of local uh, epsilon delta, local minima to min-max equilibria, we similarly have that the point x star y star is epsilon delta local min-max. If x, x star cannot be changed in a delta ball around, around it to decrease the function by more than epsilon, and uh, Y star cannot be changed to a ball around it unilaterally to uh, increase the function by more than epsilon. So these are the two notions that we're gonna be thinking about uh, because globally optimal solutions are MP hard. And uh, as it turns out, um, the epsilon delta local minimum is a notion that first order methods can actually arrive at. As long as delta, the radius in which we are looking for deviations, is small enough as a function of epsilon, the amount of improvement, and L, the smoothness of the function, which is the Lipschitzness of its gradient. So if delta is small enough, then first order methods can find epsilon delta local minima, again in a number of steps and queries to the function and its gradient that are polynomial in the relevant parameters of the problem. If you tune delta the ball larger than uh, this threshold, then you will get, you know, the, the, the solution will still exist uh, by compactness arguments, but uh, the problem is NP hard. So existence is not at risk if you consider very large deltas. However, uh, uh, you, you know, eventually your problem becomes intractable if you make the radius too large, because if you make the radius too large, you essentially are looking for a globally optimal solution as opposed to a locally optimal solution. So that delta threshold that I have there in the theorem is the right locality threshold so that the problem is not intractable. So what do we know about uh, uh, the potential existence of a similar theorem on the right? Well, first of all, existence still goes through if delta is below the threshold. So that's not a problem. So uh, on the other hand, if you tune the delta to be larger than this threshold, existence actually goes out of the window. So uh, the, in, on the right-hand side, 
you will actually lose existence if you make the, the radius of deviations to be too large. But the complexity of finding such solutions is very much unclear. So in particular, here, training oscillations could be due to computational intractability. And they're not only a byproduct of the wrong optimization method. All right. And I want to dive into this orange box in, in, in my talk. So just to summarize, OK, so what I talked about, and then I'm going to pose for questions. There are two settings that we're interested in when we're thinking about min-max optimization. The classical, well-studied, well-behaved settings where the objective function is convex concave, and the more modern, harder uh, setting where the function is non-convex concave. In the convex concave setting, the problem is tractable of finding, the problem of finding approximate global min-max equilibria is tractable, and oscillations are a byproduct of the wrong choice of method. Uh, on the other hand, the non-convex, non-concave setting is wide open, and the main contribution of, the, of this talk will be to actually uh, understand its computational complexity. So in the remaining of the talk, I'm going to do a small dive into telling you about the convex concave setting and how to correct the oscillations of gradient descent ascent. But the most, the bulk of the talk will be about understanding the complexity of the problem in the non-convex, non-concave setting. I'm going to pause here for questions before continuing. Uh, Costas, there, uh, there are two questions in the chat. Uh, so uh, Amy Grimoire asks, uh, didn't the non-convergence in the picture depend on the learning rate? How robust is the non-convergence in the picture to this parameter? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, no matter what schedule you use for the learning rate, if you use this, I mean, so if you use the same learning rate for the two agents, uh, but no matter what schedule you use for the learning rate, uh, the training oscillations uh, are, are, you know, are going to persist. So you're going to go away. Uh, so you're referring to this picture here. So yeah, if you take eta to be eta t for whatever schedule uh, of eta that depends on time, uh, or say oscillations will persist. Uh, on the other hand, if you have the two agents uh, have you know somewhat uh, you know drastically different learning rates, then you can actually get convergence to the equilibrium. So for example, if you have you know the x player run one step for every you know billion steps of the Y player, or, you know, maybe something smaller, then, uh, 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 you know, you want, you will, uh, you will, uh, uh, this, you know, multi-scale uh, method will, uh, uh, you know, avoid uh, the oscillations in the, in this convex concave setting. Okay, so what's the other yeah. question? Uh, yeah, another question uh, by Tali uh, asking, for seeking the local minima, do we assume the initial point is within the neighborhood? If so, how is the complexity related to the diameter of S? Yeah, so uh, yeah, um, 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 you, you're talking about for, 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 for both settings, uh, the convex setting, you're talking about the minimization problem, right? So for minimization mm -hmm. problems, in one case, we're thinking about global minimum, and it doesn't matter where you start. The complexity is as stated here, one over the approximation, L and the diameter of the set. For the harder case where the function F is, uh, we don't make any assumptions. Again, it doesn't matter where you start, you will get to some, to some, uh, there might be multiple, uh, epsilon delta local minima, but you are guaranteed to get to some of them uh, uh, in polynomial number of steps. Uh, there's one more, so maybe uh, let's take this uh, one more question and uh, we, we will let Costas continue. Uh, uh, so the question asks, does non-convergence occur only for vanilla gradient ascent descent or does it hold for generalized, uh, say mirror gradient uh, 
ascend to seven with Brackland divergence. Yeah, it uh, it uh, uh, oscillations happen for various yeah, so several variants of gradient descent, unless you do tricks like uh, the one uh, that, has, that that I mentioned in my my response to Amy's question, which is to carefully tune uh, the step sizes of the two players to be different, and in particular one player to have vastly smaller step size than the other player. So uh, yeah, so so these uh, oscillation phenomena are very robust. Uh, to adding various bells and whistles to gr the gradient descent procedure that you're running. But uh, as I will discuss now, <clears throat> they can be avoided if you, do, if you, if you have the right uh, bells and whistles. So let's dive into that a little bit to understand uh, what is taking place in the convex concave setting. Um, so, okay, so I, I you know, I, I don't need to preach to the choir, but sort of like, you know, one of the most important theorems in game theory is the Minimax theorem proven by von Neumann in 28, which set, you know, the foundations of uh, game theory. And um, uh, in particular, uh, this Minimax theorem uh, uh, can be uh, interpreted from a game theoretic standpoint by thinking about a game that is played by an X player and a Y player wherein the X player is trying to minimize the amount of money that they pay to the max player. And the max player, of course, wants to maximize the amount of money they receive. And von Neumann's theorem says that in any such game, there is a global min-max equilibrium. Uh, you know, there might, sorry, there might be multiple ones, but there's at least one. And in particular, the equilibria are a convex set. Uh, and the value of the min-max uh, optimization problem is always unique. So all these equilibria achieve the same value. Uh, okay, so here's one example. Let's ignore that. Uh, but uh, 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 what's also important, and as was realized by von Neumann in, the, in his discussions with Danczyk, and then you know, uh, effectively completed by Adler, who's a student of Danczyk, the min-max theorem that von Neumann showed is equivalent to strong convex programming duality, and in particular, min-max equilibria in uh, uh, functions uh, in, in games where f is convex concave uh, can be found by convex programming and vice versa any convex program can be solved by finding min max equilibria uh, for functions f that are convex concave so the problem is really well understood when f is convex concave and it's intimately related to much of the progress that has happened in uh, optimization theory in the last uh, century. It also connects very tightly with progress that was made in online learning. And in particular, that progress implies a remarkable fact that if the two players of the game interact over multiple rounds, uh, and in each round, the X player updates their strategy using a no regret learning algorithm, while simultaneously the Y player updates her strategy using a no regret learning algorithm. Then the joint behavior of the two players uh, as T goes to infinity will converge to equilibrium. So that's another remarkable fact. And you can choose any no regret learning algorithm for X and any no regret learning algorithm for Y, and you will automatically get convergence to equilibrium. However, as you might have observed, um, and in particular, one no regret learning algorithm is gradient descent, but there are many other options for you to choose from. Multiplicative weights update, follow the regularized leader, and so on and so forth. So what gives, right? I mean, I, you know, I said that, you know, no regret learning, a gradient descent is a no regret learning algorithm. And I also said that if you do no regret learning versus no regret learning, you will converge to equilibrium. What's important in the theorem statement here is that convergence to equilibrium, I put it in quotes uh, because it is in this sense that if you run no regret versus no regret, for example, if you run gradient descent against gradient descent or ascent, the average of the trajectory of the dynamics 
that will arise will converge to equilibrium. So indeed, uh, in this uh, spiraling trajectory that you see on the, on the left, the average of the trajectory is the min-max equilibrium shown in orange. But you don't get point-wise, you don't get last iterate convergence to the equilibrium, which is why you observe oscillations. And uh, if you want to think about it, let's say more metaphorically, or, or you know, uh, uh, the convergence that no regret learning has to equilibrium is the same as the convergence that the moon has to the earth. The moon goes around the earth, so its average trajectory converges to the earth. However, the moon, of course, luckily, does not itself converge to the earth. So that's the difference between uh, convergence in the average sense and convergence in the last iterate sense. And sort of like the training oscillations that we see on the left is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an outcome of the fact that you get average convergence, but not last iterate convergence. So uh, when you have a little, okay, so now, you know, continuing the analogy with, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like physics and stuff, uh, you know, uh, when you have behavior that is spiraling out of the target, effectively, what you should think is that the momentum of your dynamics is wrong the momentum of your dynamics is pushing you further and further away from the target. So, so thinking about this a few years ago with uh, Andrew Elias, who's my student, Vasily Sirganis, and how about yeah, Zheng, we, 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 um, we proposed to correct this bad momentum by using methods known in the literature uh, which are called optimistic learning methods and uh, whose uh, effective result is to uh, uh, correct the momentum of the dynamics. So uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the box at the bottom, I'm showing you how they look like. So what they do, so one of them, okay, called optimistic uh, gradient descent, what it does is at step t plus one for the minimizing player, it subtracts the current gradient, but it also adds half of yesterday's gradient. And it does the symmetric thing for the Y player. So this optimistic gradient descent undoes a little bit of the gradient push uh, from yesterday. So on my picture on the left, right, I would be adding to the blue point half of the, uh, sorry, I would be adding to my a time t, which is the blue push, I would be adding half of the uh, I would be adding half of the negative of the purple push from yesterday, right? In the hopes that this will collect correct the dynamics of my spaceship and push it towards the you know planet Earth, which is sitting in the middle. Okay, so that was that was that that you know that that that's what we proposed uh, a few years ago, um, and. Um, uh, in particular, we didn't, as I said, we did not invent uh, this method of, 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 of having, a, you know, the gradient descent with a negative, some kind of negative momentum. There are, uh, you know, this goes back to uh, progress in optimization from, uh, uh, you know, a few decades ago. Uh, and there are two, you know, prominent methods there that effectively add uh, negative momentum to the dynamics of gradient descent. Uh, and uh, one is called optimistic gradient descent ascent, and the other one is called extra gradient method. And it, it, it is known that asymptotically, these methods will actually exhibit last iterate and not only average iterate convergence to the min max equilibrium, to, 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 to the equilibrium. So, what uh, sort of like um, uh, after, after we proposed using uh, these types of methods. Uh, uh, you know, for, you know, for training, uh, for, 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 for solving min-max problems and training guns, the, you know, you know, this has sparked, you know, a lot of work uh, in the literature trying to get an understanding of the rates at which these methods converge to equilibrium. And by now, 
we have a very good understanding of the rates that can be achieved in different types of settings uh, uh, when the variables X and Y are unconstrained. So you have a really good understanding of upper bounds, lower bounds, exactly understanding the rates and different types of Fs that are convex concave, but maybe, you know, smooth or strongly convex or bilinear or whatever. So for various such settings, we understand very well the rates as long as X and Y are unconstrained. Uh, uh, but, but, but if you're looking for an open problem uh, that is very precise, we, uh, we don't have a very good handle on the convergence rates in the constraint setting. So we know that these methods will asymptotically converge to planet Earth, but we don't have uh, a good understanding of the rates at which this happens. We conjecture the rate is fast, but we don't know how to prove that yet. So if you're looking for an interesting open problem, here's a problem to think about. Uh, so, but the major open problem that I'm interested in uh, today is getting any positive result, last iterate or, or not, asymptotic or not, when F is not convex concave. And this is what I'm gonna jump into starting in the next slide. I could stop for questions because I sort of like completed a brief overview of what's happening uh, in the uh, convex concave setting before I, before I you know, go on to state the results for non-convex, non-concave. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat now. Maybe just uh, wait uh, to the end of the talk and uh... Uh, they can just ask their questions. Okay. All right, so um, let's jump to the non-convex, non-concave setting, which is the main focus of this talk. I'm reminding you where we are. Again, on the if the function is not convex on the left or non-convex concave on the right, we want to settle for approximate solutions. And these are attainable for minimization problems, but uh, uh, they are, you know, un it's unclear if they are attainable for min-max optimization problems. So our main result with Stratis and Manolis is that first order methods need a number of queries to F or its gradient that is exponential in the natural parameters of the problem to find epsilon delta local min max equilibria in this regime that I talked about earlier where these are guaranteed to exist. So you cannot replicate what is on the left to the right. Again, so just to, to, to say it again. So even though in minimization problems, you can at least hope to get to local minima if your function isn't convex in a number of, of steps and queries to your function and its gradient that are polynomial in the natural parameters of the problem. This is just impossible in general uh, in the min-max problem if your function isn't convex concave. And actually the issue runs deeper, okay? So this theorem talks about first order methods that access F and its gradient uh, but, but not higher order information about F, uh, the problem is PPD complete, which in particular means that any algorithm, first order, second order, or whatever, will have to take a super polynomial num number of steps to get to an epsilon delta local minimax equilibrium, unless the function PPD uh, collapses to P. Now, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with PPD, but here's the picture. Uh, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with P, which contains a bunch of problems like linear programming, and you're all familiar with NP, which contains a lot of problems, and it has some very hard problems like the traveling salesman problem. So PPD is a, is a class that was proposed by Paparimitri in 94, and, uh, 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 and it contains and it characterizes exactly 
the complexity of computing uh, some interesting problems in topology and game theory, like finding Brauer fixed points and finding Nash equilibria of general sum normal form games. Both these problems are PPD complete, and these are just two examples of many other problems that are that belong in the class PPD and uh, several other problems that are complete for the class, which is to say they are as hard as any other problem in the class. So our theorem that min max equilibria, approximate local min max equilibria of non-convex, non-concave functions is PPD complete. What it means is that uh, computing such local min max equilibria is exactly as hard as finding Brar fixed points of Lipschitz functions or finding Nash equilibria in general sum normal form games, and at least as hard as any other problem in PPD. So that is to say, even though min max of fx comma y is a zero sum game, and our experience with other zero sum games is that they are tractable problems, when you make the objective non-convex concave, then the complexity of the problem changes drastically and it becomes as hard as finding Nash equilibria in general sum games and finding broader fixed points. So the, the, the complexity of the problem drastically changes if the objective function is not convex concave. And let me say a little philosophical corollary of how I view this result, coming back to my very first slide, right? So, in the very beginning of my talk, I said that a lot of the progress in deep learning in recent years has been made by framing your problem as a minimization problem and running gradient descent to train a neural network on your objective function. And of course, you know, you have the hardware and you have the data, right, to support this operation. So my claim uh, is that you cannot base a theory of multi-agent deep learning using the same paradigm. And the reason is that gradient descent is going to fail. And it's not going to fail because you cannot add bells and whistles to it, like negative momentum, to make it work. It's going to fail because there is an intrinsic intractability barrier that you will have to hit the moment you go from a single agent learning problem to a multi agent learning problem. The moment you have two agents with opposing objectives or more than one or, or, or more than two agents with different objectives, gradient descent is not the right optimization method to solve your problem even if you have a, you know, a huge server okay, to do it. And, and what, I, what I want to uh, sort of like, what I want to propose as, again, as a further corollary is that in multi-agent applications of interest, we have to do a lot more work on modeling the setting, choosing the right learning model, the right architecture for our learning agent, deciding what are meaningful optimization objectives and solutions, equilibrium solutions or not, and designing the learning and optimization algorithm. And all these tasks will necessitate domain expertise. In other words, I think that multi-agent, interesting multi-agent you know, applications that would require the use of deep learning models uh, will necessitate a tighter interaction with domain experts to, uh, uh, to, to, to implement. And I think only if you do that, you will get more successes like beating human players in Go, where incidentally, the progress was not enabled by writing a crazy neural network and training it using gradient descent. Uh, inside the training procedure of AlphaGo, uh, 
there is use of game theory, and in particular, the understanding of min-max trees and Monte Carlo tree search procedures. So it's not like a blind, like even that progress was not blindfolded gradient descent of a, a crazy model that decides what to do next, given the board configuration. All right. And I think that uh, further successes uh, in multi-agent deep learning will have to be enabled by a closer interaction to domain experts who will advise on how to do one, two, three, and four. So that is what I uh, had. Uh, you know, if I had 10 more minutes, I would dive a little bit into the proof, but I don't need to do that. I can just conclude by saying that uh, summarizing the talk that minimax optimization and equilibrium computation are intimately related to a lot of important fields. And they have found profound application in a lot of other important fields. But uh, their appli its application to machine learning poses big challenges because of the dimensionality of the variables you're facing and the non-convexity of the problems. I, there are many applications already, but I expect those applications to explode going forward. And uh, uh, the uh, outcome of our investigation is that uh, finding uh, first order local min max solutions are PPD complete. And, and that suggests that you need to understand a, lo a lot more your setting so that you have any uh, uh, hope uh, to solve it. And we have been trying to do that, but there is, a, there is a ton of open problems to consider. But let me tell you some of the things that we're thinking about. Uh, what I said is that it's intractable to get to min-max equilibria in polynomial time, but maybe you want procedures that at least asymptotically converge in the hopes that if your objective function is not worst case, this asymptotic convergence may translate to a practical algorithm. So in ongoing work with Noah Golovich, another student of mine, and Stratis and Manolis, we are, we uh, are, uh, 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 we have obtained asymptotically convergent methods, albeit, you know, not necessarily converging polynomial time. Now, on the more tractable, let's say, front, uh, our results are worst case. They're complexity results. We, we, we prove that there are functions that are PPD hard to optimize. But, uh, and, you know, like uh, hammering the, the, the point I made earlier, in, in domains where you have expertise and you can model your setting better, there is hope that there is structure that enables you to compute mean max equilibria efficiently or local min-max equilibria efficiently. And uh, two settings that we have considered in recent work uh, are two-player zero-sum reinforcement learning settings, wherein, so stochastic games uh, in the sense of Shapley, where what happens is that the function, the objective function isn't convex concave, nevertheless, min-max theorem holds. So there's a lot of structure that might enable computation of equilibrium. And indeed, in this recent paper in Europe, we show that uh, there are you know, distributed, uh, uncoupled uh, procedures that converge to min-max equilibrium. Uh, and, and in some other work with uh, Yelena Diakonikolas and Mike Jordan, we, we consider uh, other more general classes of uh, non-convex, non-concave functions where uh, uh, extra grid and finds a global solution. Uh, but, but as I said, there is a ton of problems. Uh, I expect this uh, literature to explode going forward and its applications to, to practical problems. And I think it's a great uh, and fertile ground for a lot more uh, progress. Uh, thank you very much. Great. Uh, uh, so, uh... Let me just first ask the two questions that's posted in the chat box and then I'll unmute everybody. So you can just uh, 
Oh, actually, I will allow everyone to unmute themselves to do so you can uh, ask your questions. Okay, so uh, the first question is for the PPAD hardness. How is the input represented? Uh, yeah, so uh, for the PPD hardness, right? And in particular, yeah. not for the uh, lower bound, the query lower bound, right? So in the query lower bound, the exponential query lower bound, that's an unconditional result. And the access to the function f is uh, as a black box. You can ask queries to the function, it's a gradient. But for the PPD completeness result, you, ge you get white box access to the function. So it is a Turing machine in our uh, results. So I give you a subroutine, so a Turing machine. Uh, you can query the Turing machine at a point X to get the function value F and the gradient of the function. But the function output by the Turing machine is guaranteed to be Lipschitz and smooth. Uh, the second question, uh, is there a notion of convergence for the average iterates rather than the last iterate? Maybe something that generalizes the notion of coarse correlated equilibrium to the non-convex mean max problem. Yeah, so um, it really, yeah, so it, it really depends on, on, on what you want to achieve as in, you know, like for example, you know, like, um, yeah, would like I guess it's it's a matter of like it's a design choice. So right, so you know, in general, you can consider mixed equilibria in the x space and and y space, right? So you can have a distribution over neural networks and another distribution over neural networks that are in equilibrium against each other. But the question is, you know, like whether you know in your underlying application that is a meaningful thing right so like would you are you, would you be okay with a robot that uh, does not have a fixed policy that it follows but it uh, samples from a, a distribution over policies and then implements that so i can i can imagine cases where that's a yes and where that's a no so it's really a design choice but you can certainly think about yeah, distributions over uh, in this in the space X and Y or the joint space. Great. Uh, so now, if you have any questions, you can just unmute yourself and uh, ask. Okay, uh, while we wait for other questions. So some uh, a new question pop up in the chat box. Uh, what's your opinion about diffusion-based or consensus-based algorithms for distributed optimization? Are they useful? Sorry, I missed the first word. What's my opinion about? Diffusion-based or consensus-based algorithms for distributed optimization. I see. Uh, again, it really depends on the application. I mean, like, you know, like uh, one important question in the multi-agent RL literature, for example, is how much communication you need to, I I'm not sure if, if that is what you're targeting with your question, but like uh, from an equilibrium computation standpoint, one important question is how much communication you need to converge to an equilibrium. So if you, for example, launch, uh, you know, like a fleet of robots, uh, that uh, have to achieve a task, how much, how many communication, how big communication channels do you need to maintain between your robots to uh, uh, attain the task? So that's, a, that's an interesting uh, question from an equilibrium computation standpoint. Uh, you know, I can imagine cases where you have, you could have a lot of communication and cases where you know, like uh, communication is very scarce and you have to act independently. And uh, uh, that, you know, that becomes especially important when you're thinking about correlated equilibria. Great, uh, so let's take maybe one last question. Oh, thanks for the great talk, Consist. So I was wondering like, uh, how does the last result depends on the constraint set or doesn't depend on it? Yeah, so the constraint set that we have in the result is uh, very simple. Uh, it is a polytope and a it's a subset of the 0, 1 uh, hypercube and it's a polytope. Uh, but one feature, one feature of the constraint set is that it, um, 
it's a joint constraint on x comma y, the vector x comma y. Uh, and you know, one interesting uh, question to think about is whether, which I think is true, uh, you can extend the result to when you have a product constraint, like you know, like 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 kind of like like in the in the in the in the setting we have here, you have uh, I don't know like where that formulation is, but like x comma y must lie in some set S. And in particular, a choice of Y constrains the available choices for X. Uh, so, uh, well, you know, one interesting case, question to consider is what happens you have, if you have a product constraint, like X is some, in some set S and mm -hmm. Y is in some other set Q, and that's the only constraint. They're not entangled with each other. Like my choices, if I'm X, do not depend on your, like my available, my feasible strategies do not depend on your uh, choice of strategy. I see. Yeah, I was just curious, like whether for unconstrained minimax setting, the intractability results still apply. Oh, I see. Yeah. That is an interesting question. Uh, uh, well, I think, I mean, the, the two answers to your question. So one is uh, yes. So mm -hmm. I, be I, I believe, you know, is at least PPD hard, but uh, you know, you have to be careful about unconstrained because you may lose existence, right? For example, you know, like the function X, of course, has no, so like imagine, you know, like minimizing X over the, in the unconstrained set, uh, you, have no, you have no local optimal solution, right? So you have to, you have to add some constraints uh, to the problem to, to, to not lose existence. So, uh, you know, like uh, if, uh, uh, you know, you 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 know. Typically, for example, for minimization, you assume that the function is bounded, like the function value is bounded, right. and that guarantees that you have a stationary point. Um, you know, you can you can similarly try to add constraints to the minmax problem. I believe, you know, you know, uh, you know, if you do it the right way, the result is so that existence is not lost. You you will you will inherit, you know, this PPD hardness. I see. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so let's just thank Costas for the great talk. Thank you very much. Thanks for your attention. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll have uh, the next talk in two weeks.